Welcome, everybody. It's Thursday, May 21st. This is Brad Show Live. My name is Brad Bernstein, and I just got to re- uh, remind everybody that uh, today's going to be our last day before our Memorial Day break. So let's have a great show. Let's enjoy everybody and enjoy each other's company. And uh, let me first start off by saying hello to our squad and our squad's uh, top fan, Christy Consali, saying hello to everybody. Nina God Pickney, how are you? Violet Blackwood saying squad up, everybody. Chetty Manduri saying hi, everyone. Nezzy wants more. How are you? Uh, Elise, I'm sorry, Aisla Enots. I believe I'm pronouncing your name right, Aisla Enots. Squad up, Brad and team. Earth Angel Keisha. Squad up, Uncle Brad. Mod Dukes, what's going on? Lisa Bling Rose. He's yelling it out. Squad up, Uncle Brad. One immigration lawyer. Tell the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. I edit that part. Joan Grant, how are you? Jasmine McDonald, squad up, Violet Blackwood. What's going on? Shernette Miller, Monica Stone. Let's see what's happening on YouTube. On YouTube, let me say hello to Nikisha. Ed, Elisa Henry, Fiano Campbell saying squad up. Back it up, Ricky Martin, Aileen King, Carol, the top cat, Tigress 2 Anderson. Hi, Brad and Jill and squad up, Hunt. Martin Al- Alam Kang, Shanfeld here, Persaud saying, hey, Uncle Brad and squad team, good afternoon. Keep up the good work, Uncle Brad. God blessings be with you always. Well, thank you all very, very much. Uh, I do have to remind everybody that uh, before we get into our schmooze, uh, that if you do like this show, please share it with your friends and family and subscribe. Most importantly, subscribe on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed on YouTube and you watch our show, regularly or want to watch our show regularly you got to subscribe on youtube so you can get a you can get a notification every time we come live on the air and the same goes for facebook uh for those of you who are watching on facebook please like and follow us and once you do you can join the brad squad and be one of the squad who i uh say hello to every day on our show as well as uh be eligible for some great squad vip content how you do that is you got to go to Facebook and uh, join our Brad Squad page. Uh, you got to show that you're already subscribing and liking and following. And Jill, Julie Dean is going to be our gatekeeper. Make sure you are liking and subscribing. Make sure you, uh, I'm sorry, liking and uh, following and subscribing on YouTube. And she will let you in to the Brad Squad. Of course, I'm going to tell everybody on Facebook to start their watch parties very shortly. And on Instagram, although we were going live on Instagram, we uh, are only going live right now for our pandemic, um, our pandemic pop-up quarantine edition. Uh, We're only going live on YouTube and uh, Facebook. But when we get back in our studios, we'll be live on Instagram as well. And you can also follow us on that Brad Show Live on Instagram right now. And if you do, you'll get all of the best content from our shows along with the opportunity to find the Bouncing Brad. And if you find Bouncing Brad and you uh, like that post right there, and you tag five friends, you may get pulled out of my scratchy old hat every Wednesday and get a free consultation with me. If you don't need the free consultation, you can always give it to somebody else who does. And of course, you can always leave your immigration questions in our comments section. I will be answering them in about 15, 20 minutes or so. Uh, But before I answer them, uh, we get into our schmooze, but uh, if for whatever reason I don't answer your immigration question, you can always follow me at Real Brad Bernstein on Instagram. Drop me a DM. I'll be happy to answer your question. Um, finally, finally, if you want to have a consultation with me, you want to speak with me, you want to get on my list for me to give you a call, the telephone number is 1 800 529 5465. That's 1 800 Wallink, 1 800 529 five, four, six, five. Sonia Daly is already asking her immigration questions. We'll get to you in a little bit. Let me just finish saying hello to the squad quickly here. Uh, Charmaine Thompson saying, hi, Uncle Brad. Good afternoon. Violet Blackwood, what's going on? Shio Domain. Uh, Dion Watson saying hello. PJ Estan. Am I going to get this right? PJ Estan, Estan Atak, I guess. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, PJ. Tracy Haynes, uh, Carol Anderson, the Tiger, double fisting Violet Blackwood, I believe I already said hello to. And let me just check out 
uh, YouTube one more second before we get into our schmooze. Uh, Shan Feltz saying, squad up Uncle Brad with a big bicep curl. Uh, Errol Townsend, how are you? Lola Bless, Rupan, Telukdar, Jeremy Goldberg, Poetry Thursday. I got to get off my chest. Is Brad Bernstein the best? Well, Brad show is on and I am blessed. All right, Poetry Thursday for Jeremy Goldberg, Cordella Douglas, squad up and Tia for start. We're gonna get to your immigration questions in a little bit, but right now we're gonna get right into something we like to call schmoozing with Brad. So now, as of Thursday, May 21st, 2020, more than 5 million cases of coronavirus have been reported worldwide, including over 329,000 deaths attributed to coronavirus in the United States. All 50 states have at least partially reopened. More than 1.6 million cases of coronavirus have been reported. More than 95,000 people have died in the United States. Now, the WHO, Every time, I, every time I hear the who, I think of uh, Roger Daltrey and Pete uh, Townsend, if anybody knows the rock band from the 60s. But in this particular case, it's the World Health Organization, not the rock band. The World Health Organization reported the most number of cases recorded in a 24-hour period during the pandemic just this past 24 hours. So if people think on a worldwide basis coronavirus is under control, it's not. More than 106,000 cases have been reported in the last 24 hours worldwide. A big part of that comes from Brazil. Brazil is, has not closed down their country at all. They are going the route of Sweden. And uh, what, they're, what they're going for is herd mentality. We're just going to go about our day. People are going to get sick. We are not going to close down our country. And the more and more people who get sick and recover, they will have antibodies, presumably, and they will be now immune. And as we get enough people in our population immune, that will be the end of coronavirus. So now Brazil has recorded nearly 20,000 new infections in the biggest single day jump, but they're purposely doing that. They're only behind now Russia and the United States on the number of coronavirus cases. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Bill de Blasio here, right here in New York City, he's our mayor. He said that New York City could start reopening from the coronavirus shutdown, or as we like to call it, the pandemic quarantine, as early as June 1st. I guess it is a pandemic quarantine. Uh, I guess politicians don't like to call it pandemic quarantine. It sounds very awful, but that's exactly what we've been going through here. Uh, as uh, Mayor de Blasio said, all roads are leading to the first half of June. Now, clarifying the time of the city's phased reopening, de Blasio said, I'm saying first half of June. I'm obviously giving a little bit of range there, but I mean literally the first half of June. So somewhere between June 1st and June 15th, New York City is going to start to open. What does that mean? That doesn't mean we're having a party in the party uh, on every on every rooftop or in every club. Nope. It means that construction can start again. It means that um, retail businesses can start again, but people in offices. They're not going to be able to go back to offices just as of yet. Now, under phase one, it's going to be, as I said, construction, also manufacturing, wholesale supply chains, retail businesses, and curbside pickup to be specific. Now, de Blasio tatted New York City residents for the progress the city has made in its battle against the coronavirus, saying something very good is happening because of your hard work. However, the mayor said we're talking about small, smart steps we will take a series of steps over time to get back to anything normal. But I will tell you, I'm just happy that we're at least getting to step one because for the last two and a half months, we haven't even been to step one yet. So I'm happy that we're at least we're at step one. Now here, some a uh, little bit unsettling news. According to research published this week by infectious disease modelers at New York's Columbia University, uh, tens of thousands of lives in the United States could have been saved had we started social distancing one week earlier than what we did. Now, the new study, which is yet to be peer reviewed, says the lives of about 36,000 people could have been saved if, re if restrictions had been introduced just one week earlier. And if the same restrictions had been imposed on March 1st instead of March 16th, 
researchers said an estimated 54,000 people would have, would, have, uh, would have been saved. Now, even a week or two makes obviously a very big, big difference. Epidemiologist Jeffrey Shaman, who led the research, told the New York Times, the small moment in time catching it in that growth phase is incredibly critical in reducing the number of deaths. Let's watch. Maybe we don't have that. Big. We needed to have clear and consistent messaging about how grave and difficult this virus was a month ago, if not six or eight weeks ago. Now, I said, I, maybe we didn't have that video, but apparently a little slow today, but we're okay. Responding to the estimates by Shaman and his team, the White House told the New York Times that Trump's restrictions on travel from China and Europe imposed in January and mid-March respectively mitigated the spread. Uh, I don't know if it mitigated the spread or not simply because most of the people, most of the people who got sick with coronavirus in New York, this is how coronavirus spread. It spread from New York to the rest of the United States of America. And how did coronavirus come to New York? It didn't come from China, which was shut down in January. It came from Europeans because the Chinese went to Europe. They returned to Europe after the Chinese New Year. They infected Europeans who then came on holiday to the United States of America. When Europeans come on holiday, they normally come through or a big, a big, a big portion of them come through JFK and Newark Airport in New York and New Jersey, respectively. And that's how the spread happened. Had Trump stopped immigration from Europe at the same time as China, then maybe he could have be uh, patting himself on the back. Now, during the town hall in early March, Trump touted his decision to restrict travel from the United States and China, where the coronavirus is believed to have been originated. Uh, and he says he gives himself an A plus for that decision. But most people believe the real decision should have been stopping European immigration weeks earlier, because that's based on, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking. Have you ever heard that term? Uh, meaning that we look back in the past. The strain of coronavirus that came through New York that eventually spread throughout the United States came from Europe. It didn't come from China. Meanwhile, the CDC is now saying that coronavirus does not spread so easily on surfaces. Um, now, every week we learn something new about coronavirus. Three weeks ago, we were saying in our hump day that there is no coronavirus in sperm. Last week, we're saying there was. Three weeks ago on our schmooze, we're talking about wiping down packages that come in, uh, taking your clothes off as soon as you come home from outside and washing them. Well, now the CDC says, well, you know, coronavirus really doesn't really spread easily on surfaces. Uh, in early March, the federal health agency was warning it may be possible to pass on the coronavirus from contaminated surfaces. Its guidance has now changed and now includes a section on the way the virus does not easily spread including from touching surfaces or objects. Uh, now, according to the CDC, it may be possible that a person can get coronavirus by touching a service. Uh, for example, I touch my magic eight wall and there's coronavirus all over this magic eight wall and hopefully there's not. And now I touch my face. And, the, and through early March, that's what they were saying, how you can get coronavirus besides obviously somebody coughing in your face. Well, now they're saying by touching a service or object that has the virus on it, and then touching your own mouth, nose, or possibly your eyes, it's really not thought to be the main way now the virus is spreading and says that we're still learning more and more about this virus. Now, other ways the virus doesn't easily spread are from animals to people or people to animals, although, although they say the, the coronavirus came from a bat to a person. So at least it spread at least from one animal to a person. We know that. And it did spread to a bunch of lions in, in the Bronx Zoo. So, you know, when they say it doesn't easily spread, doesn't mean it's impossible not to spread. Now, the agency continues to note that the virus is thought to mainly spread from person to person, even those not showing symptoms. Specifically, it mainly spreads between people who are in close contact within six feet of each other when someone with the infection coughs, sneezes, or talks, causing droplets to land in another person's mouth or nose. They're even saying that it's less likely that you would be able to get the virus from being outside than being from inside in a closed area where there's no circulation. You're more likely in an office situation 
to get it in a closed area with no circulation than you are in the outside. You're more likely also to get it, we talked about a few weeks ago, from talking loudly. The louder you talk, the more the virus can spread from your mouth and can go further in the air to uh, somebody else. So uh, if you are in the, in, the, uh, in the vicinity of a very close uh, indoor space with a lot of loud talkers and somebody has coronavirus, that's a time that you should start panicking. Now, meanwhile, Trump uh, caused a big stir by taking hydrochloroquine, uh, a completely untested drug uh, that has been debunked by several studies saying it's actually deadly. Other studies say it helps. Really, the jury is still out on hydrochloroquine, but Trump was touting it for a very long time, and then he came out and blurted that he was taking it. Now, President Trump said on Wednesday he plans to stop taking hydrochloroquine as a defense against coronavirus in the next day or two. Now, just a reminder that the FDA warned last month, as I said, that this anti-malaria drug appears to cause serious and potentially life-threatening side effects in coronavirus patients. Now, on Tuesday, when pressed on the FDA's warning, Trump responded by attacking a non-peer-reviewed study that found an increased risk of death associated with patients who are only treating with an anti-malarial drug, calling it a false study. I don't know if it's a false study, but that study, you know, nobody really reads, you know, everything. That study said, if you have coronavirus and now you take hydrochloroquine, that is a deadly combination. I don't know of any study that says you don't have, you don't have uh, coronavirus, there is nothing going on with you whatsoever, and now you take hydrochloroquine, what does that do? Maybe it does nothing, maybe it harms you, maybe it helps you. No one has the slightest idea. So Trump just randomly started taking pills. But if you have coronavirus and you take this, that's what at least uh, many, but not all of the studies are suggesting. Now, um, yesterday we talked about uh, Nancy Pelosi calling Donald Trump fat, and uh, Donald Trump hit back and, and said that, you know, she's a mental case. Well, Nancy Pelosi uh, doesn't sit down, and uh, she, she stands back up and still fights. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said Wednesday that she called President Donald Trump morbidly obese, because he's put down women for their weight for his entire career. Let's watch. I gave him a dose of his own medicine. He's called women uh, one thing or another over time. And I, I thought he thinks that passes off as humor in certain cultures. Now, now, Pelosi told reporters at a weekly press conference, I was only quoting what doctors had said about him. So I was being factual in a very sympathetic way. That's called the backhand compliment. And besides, Pelosi suggested the president could lose a few pounds himself as the coronavirus bears down on the nation's capital. Trump responded by dismissing her as a waste of time. Now, for the record, uh, Trump is not morbidly obese, but he is obese. Now, even as the virus is ravaging Americans in the U.S. economy, uh, both Pelosi and Trump, they're not even talking to each other. They have been sparring since the beginning of the Trump presidency and more sharply since Pelosi became the Speaker of the House in 2019. The topics have ranged from the historic a government shutdown, Trump's impeachment, to playground quality name calling, and who has had the last word. But really, it's been about who has more power, a commodity never more critical than during a pandemic that has killed more than 92,000 people in the United States. Pelosi went on to lament the unfinished rescue package and noted that Republicans supported the first massive version, which she said contained only the Republican priorities. When she put forward one with Democratic priorities, her move is cast as partisan. Now, Trump is also talking about um, being a little baby on the playground. Trump is now refusing to unveil President Obama's portrait at the White House. NBC News reported yesterday that Donald Trump will not be unveiling former President Barack Obama's portrait at the White House, breaking a 40-year tradition. Obama would also not be interested in attending such an event, he said. Um, the White House and the representative for Obama did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Now, we obviously have not been able to see Obama's presidential portrait yet. You're seeing some other portraits of him, but it would be hard to top the beautiful portraits done of the Obamas by Kahindi Wiley, and, and Amy Sherald. By the way, Kahindi Wiley, his, 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 um, his, his paintings go for 
$500,000 to $1 million, a very well-known African-American artist. Now, for decades, first-term presidents have held ceremonies in the East Room to unveil the portraits of their immediate predecessors. Obama did so for George W. Bush. And uh, this is what he said. He said, George, you went out of your way to make sure that the transition to a new administration was as seamless as possible. Now, Trump and Obama have perhaps the most contentious relationship. Surprisingly, Trump has the most contentious relationship with everybody, but he has the most contentious relationship with any current and former president in modern United States history. So in recent days, Trump has made baseless, baseless allegations that Obama committed unspecified crimes before his transition from reality TV to politics. Trump spent years, if you remember, saying that uh, Obama was not even born in the United States. He was born in Africa, uh, which was basically perpetuating a, a racist conspiracy theory about Obama's birthplace because of his name and the color of his skin. So um, that's what's going on there. Meanwhile, in climate change news, a cyclone killed at least 82 people in India and Bangladesh, the most powerful cyclone to strike Eastern Indian Bangladesh in over a decade killed at least 82 people, mass evacuations before cyclone made landfall, undoubtedly saved countless lives, but the full extent of the casualties and damage will only be known once communications are restored. In the Indian state of West Bengal, Chief Minister Mamata Banjiri said at least 72 people have perished. Most of them have either been electrocuted or killed by trees, uprooted by winds in excess of 180 kilometers per hour. Uh, we have a video of the minister. Uh, 72 talk. persons have been died. That is more than corona. And by the way, this year, Eid al-Fitr, for those who are celebrating uh, the Muslim tradition, will begin on Saturday, May 23rd, and continue until the evening of May 24th. Now, Eid al-Fitr, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, is considered one of the most auspicious festivals of the Muslim community and is celebrated all across the globe with much fanfare. The festival also marks the end of the Islamic holy month of Ramadan. It falls on the first day of the month of Shawwal, and on that day, Muslims do not need to fast. Now, all across the world, Muslims observe Ramadan by fasting from dawn to dusk. They end it when they see the moon, after which the celebrations start. Now, the date of Eid al-Fitr, however, varies from one country to another, depending on when the moon is seen. It is believed that it was Allah who commanded Muslims to continue fasting to the last day of Ramadan. The same is also mentioned in the Quran. Now, Muslims have celebrated Ramadan by gathering at mosques for thousands of years through both peace and wartime, as well as during pandemics. Now, of course, during the coronavirus pandemic, you're not going to see a picture like you're seeing right now. Those large gatherings at mosques have been banned, although the buildings remain open for essential services. Now, uh, Yushu Sudik, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, Associate Professor of Religion and Islamic Studies at Texas Christian University explains that Ramadan is a time for Muslims to commit themselves more to God and render great services to the community in terms of helping the poor, assisting the needy, and sharing whatever one has with others. So this year during Ramadan, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community did just that by partnering with the Red Cross to turn the mosques under their 62 U.S. chapters into blood donation centers. This year, a virtual centennial iftar was hosted on May 9th, um, and National Director of Public Affairs for the Amida Muslim Community said in a release that all mosques will be virtually open for interfaith communities and guest speakers so it can reflect on the power of prayer during this pandemic. At the same time, our mosques are engines to serve America during these trying times. Uh, meanwhile, um, this may be the first weekend that people get on airplanes. It is Memorial Day weekend. It is known throughout the uh, modern history of the United States as one of the most traveled weekends in the entire calendar year. This year, we don't have as many planes flying because of coronavirus. But if you do plan on flying this weekend, expect a lot of changes at the airport here in the United States. Now, airports this Memorial Day weekend uh, will most likely be much emptier than usual. 
The people who are planning to fly will find changes to the screening process as well. At security lines, signs and other markings are gonna remind passengers to keep their distance. The Transportation Security Administration said today that its agents will wear masks, gloves, and in some cases, eye protection. Passengers are going to be asked to scan their own boarding passes. They're gonna be asked to place any food in their luggage in a separate bin during screening to limit contamination. Now, David Pekoski, the agency's administrator, said in a statement, in the interest of the TSA frontline workers and travelers' health, TSA is committed to making prudent changes to our screening process to limit physical contact and increase physical distance as much as possible. So most normal rules remain in place. You can only bring three ounces of any liquid, except they are now going to allow 12 ounces of hand sanitizer that you can bring on the airplane. Now, airlines are also making some changes as well. Travelers who need to check a bag, a printed ticket, for example, might find a sneeze guard separating them from a ticket agent, precaution taken in some locations by United States and Delta Airlines. In Maryland, a restaurant's new tables have huge inner tubes that make social distancing look a little fun. A popular waterfront restaurant in Maryland has come up with a way to keep customers at a safe social distance that actually looks fun. Fishtails Bar and Grill in Ocean City has brought new bumper tables, and they are surrounded by large inner tubes to keep diners from getting too close. At Fishtails Bar and Grill, the custom-built tables look like 45 vinyl. Um, is this what we're looking at? I don't know what we're looking at, but uh, look at 45 vinyl records and are on wheels, so people can walk in the restaurants, parking lot, and bar area and mingle while enjoying a cocktail or some food. Now, uh, some other restaurants for the weekend that are now open in the United States, they're doing some other weird things. One, one restaurant in Virginia, a very well-known restaurant, uh, is using mannequins to help with social distance, distancing when customers return to its fancy dining room. Mannequins dressed in 1940s style attire are theatrically staged at the Inn at Little Washington, tucked in the foothills of Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains. Although business restrictions began easing in some parts of Virginia already, restaurants can only serve dining customers in an outdoor space. The three-star Michelin restaurant has decided to wait until May 29th to resume dining indoors. So it looks like the restaurant is full, but basically you're eating next to a bunch of dummies. Now, uh, last Saturday, spring weather drew New Yorkers out of their apartment and into city parks where new coronavirus social distancing rules now apply in Domino Park in East River in Williamsburg. Visitors now find white circles painted on a fake grass lawn uh, that's popular with sunbathers and picnickers. And that way, everybody there is now also going to be social distancing. A cafe in Germany has celebrated its grand reopening to customers after lockdown by handing out pool noodles. That's what we were looking at before. We were looking at the wrong video before. So we didn't have the video, unfortunately, we, of the bumpers, but here are the pool noodles. That's right, the pool noodles, and the pool noodles are keeping people uh, six feet away. You can't get near anybody. They all have to wear pool noodles on their head. And finally, in Tokyo, uh, one Japanese pub is taking a novel approach to customer safety. Visitors at Kichiri Shinkuju, a traditional Japanese-style pub, known as Izakia, 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 however you pronounce that. They're sprayed with mist of disinfectant before they enter. Uh, spokeswoman Rico Matasunga told CNN, we want customers to feel safe when they come inside. This is geared to promote social distancing and prevent infections. I'm not sure that if you miss somebody with Lysol that um, as they're talking and eating uh, that other other germs can come out of their body. So I'm not sure that that is actually going to work very well, unfortunately, to keep people safe. That looks pretty ridiculous to me. And finally, uh, in Amsterdam, a restaurant made little greenhouses so diners can enjoy a meal while social distancing. The invention comes to us from the Waterside Vegan Restaurant, Media Medic Etten in Amsterdam. Diners are gonna be seated inside one of these little glass huts and what they call a concept house, which can accommodate two people comfortably or three at a push. Of course, solo diners are welcome too. Long wooden planks are used to serve diners, which is simply a clever way of ensuring staff can maintain six foot distance. 
Uh, and uh, that is what is going on in the news today. We got to get to our immigration questions. I do have to remind everybody a few things before we get to our immigration questions. Reminder number one, leave your immigration questions in the comment section. If you don't put them in the comment section right now, I will not see them. Number two, if you like this show and you like the information, you like making friends with lots of cool people from all over the world, subscribe on YouTube. It doesn't hurt you at all. Nothing bad's gonna come from subscribing. Like and follow us on Facebook. Nothing's bad's gonna happen from liking and following us on Facebook. Well, I'll tell you, but something good's gonna happen. You're gonna get notified every time we come live on the air. And why do you wanna be notified? Because this is a great show. Why wouldn't you wanna be notified? And there is no stigma whatsoever to subscribing to Bradshaw Live. You don't have to be ashamed or embarrassed. Most people who, who watch this show have no immigration issues. They watch it because they enjoy it. Some people watch it because they want to learn about immigration, even though they may not have a particular issue or they watch for their friends or family and they just want to be knowledgeable. So just because you subscribe, just because you like and follow, doesn't mean you have an immigration issue and it doesn't mean that you should be stigmatized that, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, somebody should think something of you. And simply the reason I'm saying that is because everybody I've spoken to who doesn't subscribe says, I watch your show all the time. I say, you subscribe? No, I don't subscribe. How come? They want to know I have an immigration problem. Well, just because uh, just because you subscribe doesn't mean you have an immigration problem. Now, also, if you do subscribe uh, on on YouTube or you follow and like us on Facebook, you can join the Brad Squad fan page for special Brad Squad VIP content. Now, this is the time on Facebook. We also want you to start your watch parties. Let your friends and family know that this show is on and we can help you. I can tell you right now that uh, we only have 30 thumbs up. So if you uh, like this show and you're watching on YouTube, give me a thumbs up right now. Also share this. And the way you share this is you go to the button right next to the thumbs and you can uh, share this uh, link to Twitter, Facebook, blog, or Reddit, Tumblr, uh, or put a copy of this link into your WhatsApp and uh, that will then text it to whoever you want. Finally, if you want a consultation with me, you want to speak with me, uh, give us a call, 1-800-529-5465. That's 1-800-WALL-INC, 1-800-529-5465. Internationally, it is plus one, two, one, two, 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 seven, eight, nine, three, three. That's plus one, two, one, two, 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 seven, eight, nine, three, three. And I said finally, but there's not a finally because we also have Instagram where you can win a free consultation with me. You just got to find the Bouncing Brad. And when you find Bouncing Brad, uh, like that post, tag five friends, follow us on Brad Show Live, and uh, you will be entered into a contest to win a free consultation with me. You could also follow me at Real Brad Bernstein. If you follow me at Real Brad Bernstein, you can drop me a DM and ask me your questions with whatever you would like to know. All right, and with that, let's start with our immigration questions right now. Let's see what's going on. Let me move this magic eight ball. Hopefully we don't have any magic eight ball questions for the day. And uh, let's see what's going on. I'm pulling out my questions right now. And uh, the first question comes from Sonia Daly. She says, good day. I applied for adjustment of status and benefits. However, I did the same for my son and he didn't receive a work permit yet or, or advanced parole. Any possible reason why this could be happening? Uh, you screwed up the application. The work permit got lost in the mail. Your application got separated from your, your son. It's one of those three. Because uh, if you filed on the same day, you both should have got it. So it's either you screwed it up or whoever did it for you screwed it up. Your case got separated somehow uh, or the work permit got lost in the mail. I think you should give us a call, 1-800-529-5465. Uh, let's see who else we got here. Uh, Je Juliet Smith with a question. Hi, Brad. Can a Jamaican with a visitor's visa that travels back and forth apply for a temporary social security card and a work permit? No, you cannot work legally on a visitor's visa traveling back and forth and get a temporary work permit and a social security number. There's no such thing. You can't enter the United States actually on a visitor's visa for purposes of working. That's a misrepresentation. Um, LC Belizean Kitchen. 
Hi, Brad. How if you come from another country with a six-month visa and you get stuck here, what will happen? Why did you get stuck here? You got stuck here because of coronavirus? Well, if you got stuck here because of coronavirus, what you should be doing is filing an I-539 application uh, with an affidavit of support, which on an I-134, and uh, a plane ticket saying you're going to leave in a few months, they'll extend your visa so you don't stay here, overstay, and, and become out of status. Um, Jerry Mias, uh, and, and by the way, uh, Rosalie Massam uh, thinks Brazil is mismanagement of the pandemic and nothing else. It's also very possible. Jerry Mias I, uh, has a question. I just got DNA tests for me and my mom, but the embassy in the Philippines is closed. How can my mother get her DNA test? Um, you go through, you don't go through the U.S. embassy. Uh, you go through uh, the USCIS authorized DNA testing, wherever that may be. I don't know the address off the top of my head of where to go. I don't know where in the Philippines your mother is, but certainly you can give us a call at 1-800-529-5465 and we can get involved and figure out where she should be going. But she doesn't go get tested at the U.S. Embassy. She gets tested at a lab. So that has nothing to do with whether the U.S. Embassy is open or not. Saddam Jadun has a question on Facebook. Hey, Brad. You're doing a great job, a great work. I have a question. So in my case, the I-130 was received on March 26, 2019. And after eight months, I got my work permit, but no interview was scheduled. My EAD is going to expire soon. Should I wait or should I contact them? My case took way too long. It's more than a year. What should I do? Thanks in advance for listening. Well, you can certainly contact them. Nothing bad's going to happen. Um, I don't think. Um, I don't think you know waiting eight months uh, for um, for an interview is overly long, given coronavirus and given the way immigration works. So I would suggest give it a few months. But you can contact them. Nothing bad will happen. Yeah, if you don't hear anything by August, uh, give me a call. Give me a call or contact them or the other. Then you should start maybe worrying a little more because then you're probably at about the year mark. Sasha Ford with a question. Hey, Uncle Brad, how long after a person gets divorced from their spouse when they have helped to get their green card, can they remarry to someone else who is out of status? P.S. This person has been divorced since 2017. You could get divorced and marry the same the next day. Um, you know, you just got to prove that marriage one was real, marriage two was real, because you don't want immigration to think that your business is marrying people to get a green card. Um, that's the only thing you got to worry about. But you can get married the next day. As long as you had bona fide marriages, both, um, you're fine. Um, Sonia Daly with a question. If the G28 form was rejected, would it affect the whole process? When I check my child's case, it says the G28 was improperly filed for EAD and EAD. And AP. It doesn't affect the process. The G28 is the attorney's notice of appearance. So if the attorney screwed up the G28, what's going to happen is the attorney will not get a notice of anything that's going on with the immigration. The immigration service is not recognizing the attorney as your attorney. And therefore, all the correspondence is going to go to you and you only. Your attorney will not know about it. So uh, your attorney needs to fix the G28 if your attorney wants to be involved in your case. Otherwise, everything's gonna to go to you. Uh, Sia West. Hi, Uncle Brad, if I receive cash assistance for my son, will that affect my widow petition? No, as long as your son's under 18, it's fine, and as long as it's for him. Um, Lisa Bling Rose. Uncle Brad, this is just a pre-comment to the day. Uncle Brad, you're doing a great job. You lift us up when we're down. Thanks, thanks up, Jesus. Thank you very much, thank you. Guinevere Goldsmith with the question, if someone is in the U.S. on a visa but want to become a permanent resident, how long approximately will that take? What is the first step in the estimated cost? You're just asking me, how do you get a green card? And there's 100 different ways and 100 different costs, and I'm not sure what we're going to do for you. So one of your goldsmiths, you need a consultation. One of the things I can never do is just how do you get a green card? And there's no like special form. You're like, yeah, there's the green card form. No such thing. Every, every case, everybody has different circumstances and situations. We need to have a consultation so we can figure it out. Uh, good evening, Uncle Brad. And this is from Brian Peterson, by the way. Brian Peterson says, good evening, Uncle Brad. Uh, I have a question. My wife is a U.S. citizen. We've been married for two years, so she's filed the I-130. It's been approved. 
uh, than three weeks ago. So how long do you think it's going to take to get the appointment to have the interview? Um, once the I-130 is approved, it has to go to the National Visa Center. You're probably about six months away if you do everything perfect. Uh, Wa Mahat with a pre-comment of the day. I watch to be knowledgeable about immigration laws in the country being an immigration immigrant myself. Thumbs up. Thank you very much. Amichi Michael Chukuma. Good evening, Uncle Brad. Keep up the great work. Uh, is it true that USCIS is currently issuing green cards without an interview for K-1 marriage-based adjustment of status? It may very well be true. I've seen a few of them. It doesn't mean that every person on a K-1 will not get an interview, but certainly uh, some people on K-1s are not getting interview. That is absolutely true. Uh, let's see what's going on on YouTube right now. Uh, Tia Persaud with a question. She says, hi, Uncle Brad and squad team. Good afternoon. Keep up the good work, Uncle Brad. God bless. And that was not a question. That was a pre-comment of the day. My apologies. Here is her question. Uncle Brad, how long for USCIS to update your address if you call to make an update to change of address? And how will you know if they update it? Will they send a notification to you? They should send a notification, but the best way to update your address is to go online and do it. Don't make a call to them and expect it to be changed. Go online do it online on the USCIS website, and then you will have a confirmation that it was done. When you make a telephone call to USCIS and do it over the phone, who the hell knows if they do it and they do it right. Uh, Rupan Talukdar, hi, one of my friends green card, is a green card holder. His spouse is waiting for an interview overseas. If she is pregnant in the interview time, is it good or bad for the spouse visa? I would say it's good, because you've proven it's a real marriage, presuming the spouse is the U.S. citizen. Um, you would also, it's not so good because you have to show how she's going to be able to give birth in the United States without um, getting on government assistance. So uh, make sure you have health insurance. Uh, Delawar Hossein. Hi, Uncle Brad. Can I apply for VAWA now? When I download the VAWA application, it says application expired April 30th, 2020. What should I do? File it. Uh, and apply for it. Um, Tiara L. Hi, Uncle Brad. If I get cash assistance for my son, will that affect my widow petition? I answered that one already. Latoya Green. Hey, Brad, my niece is filing for my brother, and he got a letter for an interview with USCIS. Does my niece have to attend the interview? His name is not on the birth certificate. Is this a problem? Uh, his name is not on. Your niece should go. I'm not sure whose name is not on the birth certificate. Whenever there's not a name on a birth certificate and you need that birth certificate to prove you are who you are, where that person is, who that person is, that's always a problem. Um, so I'm not sure whose name you're referring to, but when names are not on birth certificates, especially when they're not on birth certificates at the time of birth and they get added on later, like a father gets added on 10 years later or 15 years later, always a problem. Um, they should give me a call. 1-800-529-5465. Jay has a question. I need to apply for my citizenship. Are they taking applications and when can I send in my paperwork? They are taking applications. You can send in your paperwork today. You, there's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can send in your paperwork. Um, let's see. Click smart. Hey, Brad, my husband petitioned for me as a green card holder and the case was denied because of an affidavit of support. Should we wait until he gets his citizenship before reapplying? Uh, if you're eligible to adjust your status now or you're eligible to get your green card now, reapply now. Uh, the fact that he's a citizen doesn't change the affidavit support rules. It doesn't make it any easier. So I would, my suggestion is file again as quickly as possible, but make sure you fix the problem. California Botanical has a question. I have a very important question if we ask questions here. That is a very important question. Botanical Garden in California, if you notice, everybody's asking questions here. By all means, ask your question. Ask away, Botanical Garden. Mike Mechie has a question. Good evening, Uncle Brad. Keep up the great job. Is it true that USCIS is currently issuing green cards without an interview for K-1 marriage cases? On, to some people, yes. Um, Miss A and K, welcome. Please continue to share. Okay, thank you very much. George Yunan, can we call you? Yes, you can call me. The telephone number is 1-800-529-5465. That's 1-800-LAW-LINK, 1-800-529-5465.
Uh, let's see what else we got here. California Botanical Garden with the question now. I have a restraining order against my wife. She filed for me. We had two kids. I have a VAWA case file, but she called ICE on me. I got deported by ICE, but it seems like my VAWA case seems to be open. That's not a question. That's a statement. First of all, if you have a VAWA case, I don't think you got ordered deported. Maybe you got put in deportation, but as long as you have a VAWA case pending, you won't get deported. And if you get your VAWA case approved, that becomes a stay of removal. You don't get deported. So California Botanical, I think you need a good lawyer. And you're looking at one, if you want one. It's 1-800-529-5465. That's 1-800-LAW-LINK, 1-800-529-5465. Spider-Man, Uncle Brad, I don't have any immigration issues, but I follow you, but you don't answer me. You don't care your followers. I mean, I don't answer you. I'm talking to you right now, Spider-Man. What you talking about? Miss Olav Minkov, how do you get the most up-to-date immigration information by subscribing? It's that easy. All right, pre-comment of the day. Uh, Daniel K., hi, Brad. I petitioned the I-130 for my wife and two of my children, and it's on the National Visa Center stage. I paid every payment, and I've shown accepted on the page since February 2020. Is that normal, not getting an appointment? Yeah, they're not giving a lot of appointments right now. Um, if, you're, if you are a U.S. citizen, yes, they should get appointments. Um, but you also, besides paying all the fees, you have to do the affidavits of support. You have to do the biographic data forms. The DS, uh, the DS forms. Uh, so there's a lot more forms to do before you uh, before you uh, get through. Uh, Jay's journey. I've been a permanent resident for 20 years. I'm applying for citizenship. I have all the dispositions from prior arrests that happened more than five years ago. Do they have to be updated? No, they don't have to be updated because nothing has changed in that disposition. So as long as they're certified, they do not need to be updated. Um, Elise Campbell with a question. Hello, Uncle Brad. When is Social Security Office reopened? Magic Ape, well, when is the Social Security Office going to open? Do you know when uh, Trump's going to open Social Security Office? Uh, Magic Ape says it will most likely be open, but doesn't know when. Uh, Ricardo Garcia, hi, Brad. I have over 30 months with my VAWA and is not approved yet. What should I do? Give me a call. All right. If you're waiting two and a half years for a VAWA approval and you don't have it approved, I think it's time to get a good lawyer involved. 1-800-529-5465. Spider-Man, I'm glad we made you happy. Let's go back to, uh, let's go back to, um, let's go back to uh, Facebook. Let's see what's going on here. Uh, Ortiz Ricardo, I've been, oh, we answered that. I've been waiting for my VAWA approval more than 30 days. Um, Shami Kelman, she's late, but better late than never. Uh, Solomon Nuck, Nuttacore has a question. Hello, Brad. I came here on a J-1 visa. My DS-2019 from the counselor ticked. I wasn't subject to the two-year rule. Now I'm being denied to adjust my status. I filed for no objection. The waiver got denied. What do I do? Call me because you either are subject or you're not subject to it, and it seems to be a big issue revolving around that. Um, Everbliss, when are they going to start interviewing for immigrant visas? Uh, we know immigration is closed through June 4th. We'll see what happens after that. Let's hope after June 4th. London Ja, hi, Brad. When USCIS, USCIS states that they sent you a letter to tell you how they're going to make a decision on your I-175, what they mean, is that normal? Well, first of all, there is no I-175. I, mean, I think you mean the I-751. They send you a letter to tell you they're going to make a decision on your... I guess that would be in response to you wrote them a letter, said, hey, what's going on? And, and they said, we're going to give you a decision soon. That would be normal. If you just get randomly get a letter out of the clear blue without ever asking uh, that you're going to get a decision soon, uh, that I've not seen. Um, what does additional review mean on an I-212? The I-212 is a waiver application. It means exactly that. They're still reviewing it. More people need to look at it. More eyes need to look at it. Michael Harrison with the pre, post, and current comment of the day. Thank you, Michael. Brad, you seem to look like you've lost some weight. Looking good. Blessings, man. Well, thank you very much. I'm actually not losing weight. I'll tell you, I'm going no carb. So I haven't been really eating bread. Uh, and when you don't eat bread, even though I'm still eating a lot, 
you you just you lose all of that I guess bloat in your face or you know water retention in your face. So it's all just from not eating breads anymore more, more than ever lost weight. But thank you very much, Nalin Cole S. Hi, Mr. Brad. We applied for my son's waiver application and it's been approved now. Does, does my really need to get out of the U.S. to be interviewed at the consulate in the Philippines? Does the USCIS have a program right now during this pandemic to have it just here? It's the ice, it's the ice, if, if you have a 601A waiver, that's to go home and come back. Can your son get a green card here? Is he eligible here? I don't have the slightest idea if he's eligible to get his green card here. I would need to have a consultation with you. All I know is you have an I-601A waiver for him to go home and come back. You can have an I-601A waiver for him to go home and come back and made a mistake and figure it out that, hey, you can get a green, your son can get a green card here. Maybe not. I have no idea. But you would need a, um, a uh, uh, consultation. Um, question, can a person get a driver's license with an I-45 notice of action? No, but you can once, if you filed an I-45, and you have a work permit, you can get a driver's license. Naked Wire, hi Brad, do stepkids get automatic citizenship when they're minors? No, you can only get automatic citizenship through a natural parent, not through a step parent. Let's quickly go back to, uh, let's quickly go back to uh, uh, YouTube and see what else uh, is here. Uh, California Botanical, I think I answered the question, but let's see what else. California Botanical has to say, hi, Uncle Brad. Yes, I filed for a VAWA, but ICE still deported me. They knew I had a VAWA case pending, but they still deported me. They actually chased me on the freeway and deported me the same day. Where are you, California Botanical? It sounds like you need, you're being chased on a freeway by ICE and got deported in 24 hours. I think you need a lawyer, uh, California Botanical. Give us a call, wherever you may be, 1-800-529-5465. And the last question of the day goes to the net Gordon. Annette Gordon has a question. I filed a petition for my daughter while I was a green card holder. I'm now a citizen. Do I have to update it or is it updated automatically? No, it's not updated automatically. You have to let immigration know that you're a citizen. Uh, one hand doesn't know the other hand. California Botanical is in California. I should have figured that one out. But then if you're in California, you weren't deported in one day. Maybe you were placed in deportation. These are all different terms. California Botanical definitely needs a consultation with me. And by the way, no matter what state, no matter what state you're in, I can handle the case because immigration is a national law. It's not a local law. So all the laws apply the same wherever you are in all 50 states. And we fly all over the country to help people. And uh, California Botanical, um, I've, I've said the number several times already, but we'll say it one last time. 1-800-529- Five four six five. That's one eight hundred Law Link. One eight hundred five two nine five four six five. Don't worry, Julie. I will remember everything today. I promise you. But by the way, before I remember everything, please, if you did like our show, um, please, if you do, if you did like our show, please subscribe on YouTube. Uh, there's nothing wrong with subscribing on YouTube, and everything is right about subscribing on YouTube. Subscribe is a right thing to do, not a wrong thing to do, because you're making a great, meeting a great group of people, getting great entertainment, getting great advice and knowledge. There is absolutely no downside, no downside to subscribing, all upside, because you'll get notified every time we come on. And as you notice, we come on at different times. So the only way to know that when we're on is to subscribe on YouTube. And of course, like and follow us on Facebook as well. As I had told you, our telephone number to call is 1-800-529-5465. That's 1-800-LAWLING, 1-800-529-5465. If you subscribe and you like and follow, subscribe on YouTube, like and follow on Facebook, join our Brad Squad. You'll get extra VIP content. How do you join Brad Squad? You go to our Facebook Brad Squad page. You ask to speak to Jilly Bean. She will let you in. She's the gatekeeper. And finally, on Instagram, if you want to get a free consultation with me, it's a value of $200. Find Bouncing Brad, uh, like Bouncing Brad, tag five friends, and uh, you will be entered into a contest to win every week a free consultation with me. And of course, if you didn't get your immigration questions answered, you can always follow me at Real Brad Bernstein. Or if, even if you don't want to have an immigration question, you just want to follow me for the hell of it. 
Uh, you can follow me at Real Brad Bernstein on Instagram, and uh, you can drop me a DM. I'll be happy to answer your immigration questions. And we have some comments of the day. Lee, some comments of the day. All right. So Tia Brasord, hello, Uncle Brad and squad team. Good afternoon. Keep up the good work, Uncle Brad. God's blessings be with you always. Thank you very much, Tia Brasord. What else we got? Lisa Bling Rose, squad up. If you miss CNN News, don't if you miss CNN News, don't worry. Uncle Brad gives the same news. If you miss the show, just watch it back on Facebook or YouTube. Exactly. Uh, miss Lav Minkov, how do you get the most up-to-date immigration information? By subscribing to Bradshaw Live. It's that easy. And I think those are all of our comments of the day. I do have to remind everybody that we're going to be, it is Memorial Day weekend. We will be off the air tomorrow. We will be off the air on Monday. We'll be back on Tuesday, May 26th. Monday, as everyone knows, is Memorial Day. It's the U.S. federal holiday. It's observed always on the last Monday to honor the men and women who have died while serving in the military on both Memorial Day and Veterans Day. It's customary to spend time remembering and honoring the countless veterans who have served the United States throughout the country's history. But there is a distinction between the two holidays. I wonder if anybody knows. While Memorial Day commemorates the men and women who died while in the military service of their country, particularly those who died in battle or as a result of wounds sustained in battle. In other words, the purpose of Memorial Day is to memorialize the veterans who made the ultimate sacrifice and died. Veterans Day is the day set aside to thank all those who served in wartime or peacetime, regardless of whether they are dead or alive. Uh, Veterans Day is always officially observed on November 11th. Now, the red poppy is a symbol of Memorial Day because the war-torn battlefields of Europe the common red field poppy was one of the first plants to reappear. Its seeds scattered in the wind and sat dormant in the ground, only germinating when the ground was disturbed. Uh, in uh, by wearing, I'm sorry, the wearing of the poppy was traditionally done on Memorial Day in the United States, but it was adopted by other allied nations, including Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. In these countries, the poppy is worn on Remembrance Day. Uh, we would also like uh, here at Bradshaw Live, we would like to thank to thank those men and women who paid the ultimate price. We are deeply grateful to the sacrifices of our nation's heroes and their families. We would also like to include our nation's frontline workers who have worked so tirelessly and unselfishly, many getting sick and ultimately losing their lives during the coronavirus pandemic. You are all heroes to us. So we've made a video thanking New York City and essential workers everywhere for their service as we begin to celebrate Memorial Day weekend. Everybody have a great weekend to watch the video. We'll see you all on Tuesday.